There we go. Oh, terrific. Dr. Hunt, I see you're on as well. Thank you so much. Great. So uh, good evening, everyone. Want to thank you for joining us for what's sure to be an invigorating discussion centered on our Lapidus portfolio and specifically the Gorilla Lapidus Plate, the Preserved Lapidus Wedge, and the first of its kind, Phantom Intermedullary Nail for minimally invasive first TMT fusions. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Jim Edson. I'm our Vice President of Downstream Marketing. A few notes regarding tonight's vodcast. The vodcast is really intended to be interactive, so please type your questions into the sidebar, and I and Nick Hayes will ensure that these are shared with our presenters. Uh, we will, of course, have a question and answer session to immediately follow the presentation. Uh, thrilled to have the guest lectures on this evening, Dr. Mark Meyerson out of Denver, Colorado, Dr. Ken Hunt, also out of Denver, Colorado, Dr. Greg Guyton out of Baltimore, and Dr. Teos Patel out of Virginia. Um, all four have agreed to jump on this evening and share their experience with these different solutions and just in general with Lapidus in their practice um, historically. Dr. Meyerson is going to start us off this evening with a brief history of the Lapidus procedure and introduce the Gorilla Lapidus Plate and Preserve Lapidus Wedge System, which he has a wealth of experience with. Dr. Guyton is going to follow with an introduction to the Phantom IMS system, which he designed with Paragon 28 and provide some cases detailing his experience developing the solution. Dr. Hunt and Dr. Patel will then follow with presentations detailing how this treatment for Lapidus has evolved in their practice and present cases. Gentlemen, thank you for tackling this topic this evening for your willingness to share your experience. Dr. Meyerson, I'll go ahead and let you take it away. Good. Well, hello, everybody. And here we go. So let's uh, start here. You know, uh, historically, if I go back to the early 1980s, there was a huge controversy about uh, the indication for the lapidus, just huge. What, what, were, what was the indication back then? Well, it centered around hypermobility. And of course, that led to a plethora of studies that came out showing that there is or isn't hypermobility or that there's more hypermobility with hallux valgus or that it's the same. But realistically, those studies guided us in the wrong direction because instability of the tarsal metatarsal joint is not just a radiographic diagnosis, it's also clinical. And there are three planes of instability. So sagittal plane is what we used to think about uh, back in the 1980s and still to some extent uh, today. Uh, and you can see here, here's a patient with uh, motion uh, on the uh, right foot. Perhaps you could construe this as uh, being relatively mobile, particularly when you see what's going on in the opposite right foot. There's absolutely no motion at all. In fact, you can see the callus under her first metatarsal head indicating excessive pressure. Here we have a similar situation here, minimal movement on that side, and here excessive movement on this side. So what does that all mean? Well, there's some individuals who've got unilateral or bilateral excess motion at the tarsal metatarsal joint. And I guess the question then is, does this indicate the lapidus procedure or one of its modifications? Certainly when you have this type of situation where the tarsal metatarsal joint is clearly involved um, with a flat foot, it should be considered as part of the flat foot procedure. And you can see there's the instability. And we now take this to a different level because uh, instability is not necessarily in the sagittal plane. Here you can see excessive motion in the transverse plane. So if you put a strapping on the forefoot, <coughs> take an x-ray, both with or without strapping, you'll see that the strapping completely reduces uh, the tarsal metatarsal joint, as well as to a large extent, the, the hallux valgus. So is this an indication for lapidus procedure? Certainly in my practice, it is. I think this is a very important plane of instability. And you can see here on the left, what happened here after proximal metatarsal osteotomy, the metatarsal is falling off uh, the uh, medial cuneiform. And this to me indicates instability. And this was an indication for a lapidus procedure. Now, please note the difference between what many of us do, which is the modified lapidus procedure, or here as illustrated, 
the true Lapidus procedure. This is what Lapidus originally described, which was stabilization <clears throat> between your medial and middle column. Now, why do we do this? Why, why operate uh, at the base of the metatarsal and why is the Lapidus procedure indicated? Well, it's a, it's a so solid and sound principle to operate at the apex of any deformity. And uh, in this case, we're not talking about the center of rotation axis or the cora. We're just talking about the, the apex of this particular deformity. Here's another reason. This is a cadaver, and you can see the tremendous instability that takes place. Now, this brings to mind the third plane uh, of instability or the third problematic plane, which is uh, in the coronal plane. And you can see this again here. If you just take uh, this and under fluoro, you manipulate the metatarsal in pronation and supination. There's been a lot of work uh, initiated by Emilio and Pablo Wagner. And this is very relevant because supination of the metatarsal is an integral part of the lapidus procedure. It must be, must be incorporated since pronation of the metatarsal is present in well over 80% of individuals with hallux valgus. So you can see here, uh, to me, an indication for lapidus procedure. Is this a true DMAA problem? Uh, well, perhaps not, because if you look there, that may be more apparent than real. We know that this is associated with pronation of the metatarsal, which leads to an apparent increase in the DMAA. And you can see the subluxation of the sesamoids corrected here with the lapidus and supination of the metatarsal. That's all it is really. Supination of the metatarsal corrects this apparent DMAA. Now, here you can see another interesting case where really the, the implications of supination are important because here you can see failure at the base of the metatarsal, subluxation of the tarsal metatarsal joint, but most importantly, what appears to be a significant increase in the DMAA. Now, you can, of course, treat this with a lapidus and a closing wedge distal osteotomy, regardless of what type it is, but if you supinate the metatarsal, this is obviously not perfectly derotated because you can still see a little obliquity to the metatarsal head and very slight subluxation of the sesamoid. But still, this is only with supination, no additional osteotomy. These osteotomies are translational or angular. And no rotation nor supination of the metatarsal is really possible with these type of osteotomies. This concept applies to the lapidus procedure. So here you can see a lapidus procedure has been done, but there's failure. There's recurrent hallux valgus. And how do we know this is a problem? Well, first of all, the intermetatarsal angle doesn't look all that bad. But take a look there. The sesamoid is still subluxated. And if you look at that uh, carefully, you'll actually see there is pronation as evidenced by the position of the sesamoid. So supination is an integral part of uh, correction of this metatarsal. So when we, when we do the procedure here, you can see what I'm doing and I'm squeezing it together, but more importantly, I am supinating the hallux and in turn supinating the hallux and the metatarsal to help me with stabilization and my correction. Now, what are some of the other indications, quite apart from what we may consider to be instability? What are the other indications for a lapidus procedure? When you've got severe elevation of the first metatarsal, I think that a lapidus procedure is a very good idea because it's, it's really difficult to plant a flex that first metatarsal with just about any alternative procedure. Now, you can now look at other indications. What about arthritis? I think that this is a curious phenomenon because when we have hallux valgus associated with arthritis, it's probably uh, the result of sagittal plane instability of the first tarsal metatarsal joint leading to overload of the second and third. So in a case like this, uh, clearly arthritis is present in the second and you need to stabilize the first metatarsal at the tarsal metatarsal joint. What about uh, metatarsus adductus? We have uh, looked at this, we've published this, and we felt that 
with severe deformities, a lapidus procedure is indicated. But realistically, a lapidus procedure on its own will not correct this deformity because there's no room for you to move that first metatarsal. What has to be done is to correct all the lesser metatarsals. And you can see that here. Here's another example, but this is not done with the lapidus procedure. And, you know, it makes me wonder uh, to what extent is correction at the tarsal metatarsal joint important? And you compare that, for example, with coverage by the metatarsal head over the sesamoids with supination of the distal metatarsal, because obviously that is relevant, although there's no real instability here. Um, but excuse me one second. Okay. Now, here's another example, both of uh, relative metatarsus adductus and instability. And you can see here again, corrected in this case with minimally invasive procedures with osteotomies done through MIS at the base of the metatarsal without an arthrodesis at the tarsal metatarsal joint. And you can see the osteotomies have been done there. So, you know, I raise this question because on the left, of course, you see what for me, this is not my case, incidentally, uh, but for me would be a lapidus procedure. You can see the obliquity of that tarsal metatarsal joint. You can see the obvious severe uh, intermetatarsal angulation and yet pretty reasonable correction uh, with this MIS procedure. So I, I, I think it's worthwhile putting this into our thinking as part of our algorithm for each of us as to what we're doing. Now, the screw technique, I'm going to, this takes me back really to the 1980s when uh, I would do it, uh, the procedure using two screws. But this actually is, I just want to show you a true lapidus procedure where I use two screws. Then all I do is I take a saw and I scrape in between the middle and the medial column. That simply breaks it up, it scarifies it, uh, and then you can, you don't have to put any bone graft in there. It's simply to stabilize it when you've got continued instability after your fixation. What about fixation? Well, I, I've certainly seen my own evolution. I, I probably was not in the 1980s and 1990s doing the lapidus procedure according to very good biomechanical principles of axial compression. Um, I then have had experience with staples and plates, ultimately with this plate, which I think does make sense. Why, why is a medial plate irrelevant? Because it stabilizes your sagittal plane motion completely. As Greg Guyton will talk in just a little while, the nail stabilizes the tarsal metatarsal joint in both the sagittal and the transverse plane. So in some instances, that may be much more relevant fixation. One of the things I really like about this is, of course, it's medial application, your compression first using your dorsal screw with your precision guide, and then that planter screw. That planter screw, I think, is very important. Now, you can angle that screw for further compression across your middle and medial column, or you can actually get some compression. Now, why does failure of the lapidus procedure occur? Here we have um, uh, a procedure done, uh, which led to a non-union uh, and plating medially. W what is it? Uh, clearly, you know, this is not a paragon plate. Um, I I'm not implying that uh, this is poor technique, but th there's something about the application of the paragon plate, which does make sense. So this was revised. Here you can see the revision procedure, still uh, not very good. There's still a non-union at the tarsal metatarsal joint. Now, it brings me to uh, take a look here at the technique. Stabilize the metatarsal, use your precision guide. This is an absolutely wonderful system. It really facilitates the entire procedure. Take your precision guide off, you now got your plate stable. I don't like the use of this screw as illustrated in the animation. The screw threads are too short. And I will say that in many cases, I'm not even that interested in compression here. I want stabilization. I want a good stable construct. 
and not infrequently I will use a fully threaded screw here rather than that small uh, little partial thread in an attempt to get compression. And that's of course a little debatable. Here we can see the result of uh, the procedure associated with a flat foot. Uh, you can see mild uncovering and obvious collapse of the medial longitudinal arch, osteotomy done at the calcaneus. And here's another case where there's hallux valgus, not a severe hallux valgus, but associated with more profound uncovering uh, of your talar navicular joint. So as part of the reconstructive procedure, lateral column lengthening, in addition to the lapidus procedures done. Now, perhaps we shouldn't be calling this a lapidus procedure, but rather a first tarsal metatarsal joint stabilization, because there's not terribly much hallux valgus here. Indeed, the, the slight pronation of that first metatarsal that we see here is more likely to be associated uh, with the flat foot uh, rather than the other way around. Again, here, illustration of uh, the use of the precision guide. I really like this. You know, the precision guide is now part of every plating procedure for Paragon. And it's such an essential, uh, it's a game changer. It makes the entire procedure so much easier. What I, I have not demonstrated, and perhaps Greg, you can go over this, is preparation of the joint. In fact, I know you're going to go over it uh, because if you've got a very, very good joint preparation, I think perhaps we, we can all discuss the need for compression or for added compression and how relevant is that. And here you can see the result in that particular case. However, note the subluxation of the sesamoid. So maybe this is not all that well done because it implies that you don't have excellent reduction. Just remember that earlier lapidus procedure with failure that I showed, and maybe this will indicate later uh, subsequent failure because your sesamoid is still subluxated and in, implies that the first metatarsal may be pronated. Now I want to shift a little bit to the use of the preserve wedges. As you all know, the preserve wedges are terribly important in reconstruction. These are particular pieces of allograft taken from dense uh, bone. And in the tarsal metatarsal joint, the preserve wedge comes from the distal femur. And you can see here the need to lengthen that first metatarsal. You've also got very severe arthritis with a cyst. And you can see the, the, these are the preserve wedges. They come in a very wide range of sizes. Um, actually, I, I, this is one thing that I would like to see increased because I sometimes find that we need at least 12 millimeters um, for restoration of plantar flexion of the tarsal metatarsal joint. But nonetheless, you can see the procedure here with use of a very nice preserve wedge. Another example here, a failure uh, of a prior lapidus uh, treated here with another with a preserve wedge, as we see there. This is not a hallux valgus case, but it again indicates the utility of a preserve wedge, where we've got this adductus uh, with stress fractures laterally and obvious erosive changes of the tarsal metatarsal joint, treated with multiple osteotomies and a preserve wedge in the first tarsal metatarsal joint. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I assume, Greg, you will continue. Well, great, Mark, thank you. Um, I'm gonna try to share my screen. And here we go. Hopefully it's up. Can everyone see that? All right, great. I think everyone can see my screen. Are we good? All right, so I'm gonna run through uh, the percutaneous lapidus with an IM nail. And I'm gonna give a little bit of a different uh, take on some of the rationale for the lapidus as we get started as well. Uh, and mine's gonna be based not on definitions of instability, although everything Mark told you is absolutely correct. Um, it is gonna be based a little bit on the literature and what, what literature support can we have for doing the lapidus in the modern context. So there seem to be two independent trends in foot and ankle, this concept of MIS surgery, which is largely based around osteotomies, and then also the move towards the lapidus and the, the general uh, interest in the lapidus. There are a couple Hallux Valgus papers that I really want to emphasize and emphasize to my own fellows. One of them is this one, it's an old one, and it's in a journal that has an impact factor in the 40s and 50s, it's from JAMA. 
This is the actual only randomized controlled trial of doing bunion surgery or not doing bunion surgery. And so it supports everything that we do it's from Finland. And what they used was a Chevron osteotomy, old school, done Austin style without any fixation, no K wire, nothing. They didn't measure IM angles. And their only entry criteria was that you had a hallux valgus angle that was over 35 degrees. And what they found, of course, is with doing a Chevron osteotomy was better than not doing surgery. So the point of that is that the Chevron can still work. It's still applicable to a large number of bunions, despite everything that we're talking about, about the lapidus. But let's talk about the lapidus. And to do that, we need to talk about the alternatives. This is actually one of the best bunion papers ever written. This is Peter Bach's paper with Hans Trinka. It is out of Austria. And it is the single longest term follow-up of any bunion uh, series. It's a level four case series, but it's incredibly well done. An average of 124 months, so over 10 years. Uh, there is a 30% recurrence rate by radiographic criteria at that 10 year mark. Um, and that's remarkable. So we aren't doing as well with bunions as we think we are. Um, now, radiographic recurrence, it turned out, was a necessary but not a sufficient criterion for clinical failure. So not everybody who failed had to go on and have another surgery, but the radiographic recurrence was remarkable. This is the thing that gets me. What correlated with failure? Well, the pre-op hallux valgus angle, if it was bad. Now, what didn't correlate with failure? And notice that top one. Unless the IM angle was really, really bad, the IM angle didn't correlate. And the other one that's important, and this is, speaks to the lapidus, is what about the quality of the intermetatarsal angle correction at six weeks? So they did scarps. You know, this is a, a single plane, transverse plane correction. Um, and they found that even if that x-ray looked good, by the way, we usually judge it by the IM angle at six weeks, that did not predict whether or not that patient was going to go on to fail at 10 years. So what that speaks to is the, is the problem that these patients are deforming. They're deforming from somewhere. They're not born with a few exceptions with a metatarsus primus veris. And where they're probably deforming is from the, the TMT, but possibly also from the intermetatarsal, as we'll talk about later. So this is the traditional indication for the lapidus, as Mark showed. But I think there are more indications. And to be honest, it may simply be bunions that aren't acceptable for a chevron. And I've largely abandoned proximal osteotomies in my own practice. The other thing that used to be said about the lapidus is it, well, it's bad for athlete, athletic activity. Well, I still don't do lapidus procedures on most professional athletes, but if you're looking at people who want to be recreational athletes, this is Scott Ellis's work. It's one of the few uh, things that's out there on this. And they did a sports focused questionnaire on patients under 50 and actually found that people were doing remarkably well, that 41% unchanged and 40% improved after lapidus procedure in terms of their recreational athletic activities. Now, what about weight bearing? Well, it may actually be better than proximal osteotomy. Mark's already shown you a very nice plate uh, uh, for the lapidus procedure. And the fact is with the limited bone available to you with proximal osteotomies, it's hard to get fixation that's as good as if you cross the TMT. So certainly uh, there's a lot more fixation options open for you. And I've been weight bearing my uh, lapidus nails, as I'll show you in a minute, for quite a long time. This is actually orthogonal plating paper that is from, the, uh, from FAI uh, doing well with regard to non-union. So uh, the modern trend, I think, is going to be to let lapidus patients walk. So let's put all this in context. There's a new awareness of rotation, as Mark spoke about, uh, driven by the Wagner brothers and others and Okuda from Japan, and then the advent of MIS techniques. Rotation is a recent addition to the bait. Uh, Okuda and Wagner have both pointed out separately this concept of the, the shape of the metatarsal head, the lateral aspect of the metatarsal head, and whether it's rounded or uh, sharp. And that's basically, this is from Pablo Wagner's paper, uh, in which you see a rounded metatarsal head on one side, one that's been corrected. And it's been, all that's happened here is it's been rotated. The sesamoid position has improved and you've gone from a rounded metatarsal head to a sharp metatarsal head. And it's pretty clear that what we used to always call high DMAAs or uh, you know, these round metatarsals is probably a large percentage of them were in fact just pronated metatarsals. What about these other procedures in context compared to the lapidus? Well, the distal osteotomy, as we mentioned, is supported by 
a randomized controlled trial. It's also important to remember that when we compare the Chevron, which is the target of most of your MIS techniques, a Chevron or a Chevron-like big shift osteotomy, and you look at the literature, there's a JBJS trial that supports it, but it doesn't show superior outcomes with MIS techniques. It shows equivalent results with MIS techniques. And that's an important point because the, if you're looking for a reason to do MIS, and that's not why you should do things, but if you're looking for support for MIS, there's, when you're talking about a pretty small, simple, reliable operation like the Chevron, there's not a lot of pop from doing that MIS because the open operation is reliable and does well as long as you have the right indication. Proximal osteotomies has concerns for long-term outcomes, but based on that Hans Trinka paper. And the single plane osteotomies are elegant in concept. I'm talking about things like the PROMO, which is a very elegant proximal osteotomy, but they're not inherently stable. And I worry about weight bearing in those patients. So it could be potentially problematic. Uh, this is the uh, JBJS trial, level one RCT, open versus MIS Chevron osteotomies. And it's been used to support MIS, but it should also be noted, the results are not superior with MIS to an open technique that we all know how to do and have been doing for a long time. So MIS has traditionally approached, uses large utilitarian distal osteotomies with large shifts. And there's an emphasis on avoiding the joint capsule. Well, the large shift Chevron and large shift Distal osteotomy has been around for a long time. This is the old isoplate from a manufacturer that's not around anymore, but these concepts have been around. Um, and the large shift chevron with MIS is typically practiced with these oblique screws that are put in proximal to distal. Now, in the right patient, that's a reasonable thing to do. The problem is uh, it tends to lead to some transverse plane stress on the TMT. And here you see, you would look at that patient first glance, looks like they're doing great, but then you look at the transverse plane. And the problem is we don't really know how that's going to do over a long term. We do know that there is a long-term potential for destabilization at the TMT from the Bach and Trinka paper, which is our best long-term follow-up paper. Now you can take that to the extremes and have a patient walk out with some straight toes, but there's a lot of dangerous things going on inside the joint. And this was a, I'll call this a wild caught x-ray. It was done about 50 miles away from me in the community. Um, and uh, there it is. I uh, happened to see this x-ray on, on follow-up. So the question is, is MIS a revolution? Well, the answer is maybe, uh, but the issue is the distal osteotomy was already pretty good. It was described by Austin, popularized by Johnson. It can be done with or without fixation actually. Uh, old school, it was done without any fixation. It can be done with immediate bear weight bearing. And as you see from that finished paper, it actually works out pretty well for an awful lot of patients. The problem is, if you're going to be doing something MIS that needs to be more than a marketing gimmick, it needs to change a paradigm. It needs to change either outcome or rehabilitation. So that's where we get to the lapidus with a nail. So the advantage of the nail, it's incredibly strong, and we'll talk about that later, but it allows early or immediate weight bearing. It also has minimal shortening with no tendency to dorsiflexion. We'll show you as we go through the slides here in a minute. As you compress over the nail, because the nail is obliquely oriented from distal dorsal to proximal plantar, as you compress, it also tends to slightly plantarly translate the metatarsal head, the first metatarsal head. That is a compensatory maneuver as far as the weight bearing on the first metatarsal is. Um, to any shortening that you get, because there's always some obligatory shortening with any bunion procedure. So the nail has this inherent compensation for it, which is very nice. It uses MIS incisions, it can correct rotation, and it assures stabilization of the TMT. So the idea here <coughs> is not to take a, a, a operation that already works pretty well and do it MIS, it's to take an operation that is open and is a little bit bigger and it's also a known successful and durable operation with vast experience and change the paradigm. Do something that allows those patients to recover faster and wait here immediately, and that's the concept. So let's run through the, the technique for the percutaneous lapidus. Uh, with, this is with nail fixation and early weight bearing. So the indication's basically the same as an open lapidus procedure, and I'll throw one caveat into that, and if we get to the cases, I'll, I'll, I'll show you one, but um, the caveat is, I would not attempt severe metatarsis adductus 
with a percutaneous technique. Um, it can be difficult in a more severe metatarsus adductus to get your correction, um, particularly if you feel that you need to medialize the base of the first tarsometatarsal joint. I think that is probably best done open. Uh, it's easier to push the base over uh, and it's also easier to fix that base than if you're just trying to do it through a nail. So I would be cautious in cases of metatarsus adductus. I think this is most appropriate for cases that don't involve metatarsus adductus. This is the nail in question, let's go back here. So again, as we talked about, the nail comes in distal dorsal to proximal uh, plantar. And so as you compress over the nail, using a compression distraction device, you get remarkable compression. And, but as you compress, you are also slightly, because of the obliquity of the nail, slightly plantarly translating the metatarsal head, which is compensatory for any shortening that you have. So we start with resection. Now this is different than what you would see um, if you're doing MIS and you're gonna be doing a chevron osteotomy where you would typically make the uh, incision to do that here, proximal to the capsule. Here, if you're gonna take out the medial eminence, you'll do it distal. You do not have to take out the medial eminence. You can do this without medial eminence resection just fine. But if you choose to do it, you do it distally. And this is actually over the proximal phalanx. That has an additional benefit. The benefit is if you need to do an Aiken later, you've already got your incision. So this incision works well for taking out the medial eminence from distal to proximal, but it also works perfectly for an Aiken if you need to do that at the end of the case. Um, and so this is a, a short video. You need to get used to the concept of using the Shannon Burr. And I think that's beyond the scope of tonight's uh, discussion. But it, using the Shannon Burr is a concept of, of tactile sense, but also yet a, an auditory sense. Um, it, is, it does not have the tactile feedback that, for instance, using a drill does or even a saw. And much of what you're listening for is the engagement of the burr with the bone. And that's often how you get a sense of what's going on. Now, there's another advantage from this approach. If the patient has a small dorsal osteophyte, you can do it. You can come in from this same incision and sweep across the top of the uh, metatarsal head and actually do a little chylectomy with it too from this same incision. People often ask, what about the nerve? What about the dorsal mediocutaneous nerve? What about the EHL? And that, that you kind of have to trust. You have to go to the lab and try out the Shannon Burr. It is remarkable. As long as you don't put stress on the top of those structures and actually push them down over the top of a spinning Shannon Burr, it's remarkably difficult to cut them. And in the lab, I encourage you someday, if you have a Shannon Burr, take it. You can actually hold the entire foot up by a spinning Shannon Burr underneath an EHL, and it will not go through. So there's an element of safety. Can I, can I sit here and tell you it's perfectly safe? No, that would be foolish. But I can tell you, as long as you avoid taking your finger and pressing right down on top of those structures, you're going to be okay. Now, the next step is joint preparation. And this is an important thing. When you prepare the joint open from a dorsal incision, which is a, a common way that we do it um, for open procedures, um, there is a tendency, particularly for the fellows, to, to kind of tunnel in. In other words, they do a better prep on the top than on the bottom. Well, that's problematic because that's gonna lead to a dorsiflexed first TMT. And we spend a lot of time using a small joint distractor and making absolutely sure that we get down to the bottom of the joint when we do that prep. When you do the prep MIS, the, the, the prep is gonna be done from the medial side. And inherently, because we're gonna sweep dorsally and plantarly, we are going to inherently prep the top of the joint evenly with the bottom of the joint. So there's an inherent advantage to that approach as you uh, debride it. You need to get a dorsiflexed a radiographic view of the TMT, and then you stick a knife in its e sounds from the mid-medial line of the uh, metatarsal. It's not of the foot, but it's of the first TMT. And then you sweep vertically to release the medial capsule. Now, we worry about the anterior tib, but it's actually well clear uh, into, of the anterior tibialis insertion, which is primarily into the cuneiform. So <laughs> at this point, you've opened the capsule and there's a paddle. So you stick a small paddle that comes with a set into the TMT. Here's the paddle here. Over the top of that paddle comes a little guide. And that guide is marked for the cuneiform and the metatarsal. Now, as I've gotten more experience to this, I go ahead and get a little bit of correction in the transverse plane at this point. 
and you will drop in one or two pins, one into the cuneiform, one into the metatarsal base. Commonly, I'll go ahead and get a little correction and shoot this pin across into the base of the second metatarsal around this point. This is what it looks like, and we, we get a little bit of correction. The paddle is in the joint. And so at this point, we're gonna pull the paddle, and this gives you basically an initial guide into the joint. Now, the beauty of the Shannon Burr is it tends not to end cut very well. It is not like a drill. It is a side cutting device. So as long as you're going into the joint, you can then typically by feel be able to advance this along because it's side cutting into the joint, into the soft cartilage. But when it hits this base of the second metatarsal, it stops. And of course, I usually take an x-ray to confirm that I'm at the right depth. But once I get there, then I can use this to sweep up and down. Uh, and the goal here, you're going to irrigate it the whole time that you do it. As you sweep up and down, you're basically trying to create a, a starting point for your, uh, for your debris mine. And that's the, that's the basic idea. Uh, so here we are sweeping up and down. Once you've done that with the guide, then you take the guide off. You have to maintain a bit of a free hand, and that all of this needs to be practiced in the lab before you do it live for sure, um, because the joint does have a slight twist to it, and you need to follow that twist. But at this point, you do a freehand completion because the dorsal and plantar aspects of the joint can't be reached through the guide. And so you do have to complete it freehand. Now, this is where people worry, am I, cut, am I cutting the EHL? Am I in danger? And the answer is no. You actually, if you dissect these later, you don't even go through the capsule because the Shannon Burr is very bad at cutting soft tissue. So you, cut, you basically debride it without going through the capsule. And this is an example of the freehand completion. My finger is not on top of the joint, it's over on top of the second cuneiform. And notice that we're listening to the sound of the burr as we go. At every step, you're going to express the paste as you go along. And the next move is to, is to go ahead and uh, prepare the joint. There is a curved osteotome that comes with the set that we use. I also drill it. Um, so I will drill it, I will shingle it. I will use a small curette to get out any residual paste and any bone fragments that are in there. I do actually, in most of these, uh, go ahead and put in a small amount of uh, calcaneal bone graft that I will harvest at the same time just to make up any defects. I do that as a matter of uh, being safe because I'm not looking at the joint. So I never actually see the joint prep, uh, even though I do uh, methodically work my way through with a, a curved osteotome. So here you see just some of the work on the, you sort of methodically work your way around. Now, the reduction. There's a couple of different ways to do the reduction. I typically do it with a wire construct. So the first wire comes in here. This is a joystick. And the joystick is going to be used against my thumb to derotate, to supinate the metatarsal. This is a pusher. So this is against the base of the first metatarsal. And it's going to be used to push the base of the first metatarsal medially while I put my other thumb here and push on the metatarsal head while I use the joystick to derotate it. These wires are pre-placed in order to shoot them across into the, uh, into the second, uh, and second uh, metatarsal and also into, and there's the plane. So you see the joystick is up at uh, 45 degrees. Here's the pusher and these are the fixation. So they're gonna provide temporary fixation by going into the second metatarsal and the cuneiform. And this is basically the maneuver uh, as we sit here, your thumb, you are going to supinate while you push. And this is, the, this is the reduction maneuver that will achieve rotational correction and also push the base medially and correct the intermetatarsal one, two angle. So that's the goal. Uh, at this point, you drive the prepositioned pins into the adjacent rays, and now you've got it pinned. This is another way to reduce it. If you're not so worried about rotation, you can simply hook it. So if you have one that's not rotatory, uh, it doesn't need a rotatory correction, you can hook the base and pull it back. At this point, it's a matter of going ahead and putting in the nail. And this is very similar to the open technique for putting in the nail. There's a small device for finding the incision. You want to, uh, I put in a, a little K wire here to let me find the joint on top, keeps it easy. And then there's a couple of devices to target uh, the, uh, the incision. It has to go in slightly lateral to the EHL. There's also a targeting pin that goes into the plantar and proximal aspect of the cuneiform. And this is pretty easy. It goes in parallel to the medial column of the foot. And this is going to be to align your jig. I'm gonna skip through some of this quickly because it's very similar to the open technique, but the jig is a radiolucent guide that goes on that location. And there's a very nice targeting arm 
Now at this point, you need to start this slightly lateral to the midline of the first metatarsal. And the goal is that you're, it's a very powerful compression device. So if you start it over on the medial side, there is a danger that as you compress, you will apply a little medial correction to it and you will lose some of your IM12 uh, correction. So you wanna make sure that it starts slightly lateral to the midline that also tends to line up perfectly with the center of the cuneiform. And so what we do is we start it with the 2.4 millimeter guide pin, but as we're checking our position, we just drive that guide pin in just about a millimeter so we can see it. And then we check it fluoroscopically. Once we're happy with it, we'll ream over the guide. And at this point, it's a matter of inserting the nail. So the nail has a uh, interlock. There is a uh, proximal, uh, the, typically we use a three hole nail. And so we're going to be dropping in a pin that will abut the nail on top here at first. And then there will be an additional proximal interlock which goes through this hole right here. And this is just like putting in any other. So this is what it looks like. It's like putting in any other interlocking nail. And the guide pin is actually your drill. So this will serve to put in your first interlock. I'll cut through some of these as we're talking. Complete the interlock. At this point, you can either leave the proximal outrigger on or you can take it off. And the goal here is to compress with the torque driver. The torque driver has numbers between 80 and 100 Newton meters. I actually go a little past it commonly, but it's a remarkably stout uh, compression device. At this point, you can put in a medial to lateral interlock, just distal uh, to the uh, joint, and that will uh, solidify your prep. And lastly, through the same incision, you can place a dorsal to plantar interlock. And there's a little trick for getting that. Typically, if you put the pin down the nail first and then put the locking tower on top of that, it, it centers the locking tower and makes it easier to do because you're doing this blind. You're not looking at the nail. The nail is already sunk through this percutaneous incision. So this is what you end up with. You end up, these incisions are actually drawn a little bit big. End up with about a six millimeter incision here on the side. You will have a small dorsal medial incision for your proximal interlock. And then you'll have the nail insertion incision, which also will serve as your interlock incision. And then of course, if you've taken the medial eminence, you'll have a small incision here. People often ask about lateral release. I do not do the lateral release first. I wait and I see where we're gonna be at the end of the case and it's, down to about, I would say 30% of the cases that I do a lateral release at the end, uh, and probably about 30% of the cases that we will do an Aiken on as well. But remember the Aiken doesn't add an incision, your incision is already here. And you can do the Aiken MIS very easily with the burr. That's actually one of the easier operations to do with the burr. You just go across and sweep up and down and you don't have to remove any paste or anything because that's good paste when you're doing an Aiken. It's not a joint, it's bone paste. So it's okay, you just complete the osteotomy and then put in a small oblique percutaneous screw uh, from proximal medial to distal lateral. So those are your incisions if you do everything. Um, here's just a quick case. This is a 52 uh, year old female. You can see she has some traditional indications for the lapidus. So this one is more straight up, not just because it's a severe deformity. And if you look here, she's got a rounded lateral aspect of the metatarsal head. Um, and so, this is one that has a pronation deformity. Now in this one, I also did a limited incision metatarsal osteotomy, uh, but we did everything. We did an Aiken, uh, we've achieved the correction. You see, I have medialized the base here a little bit um, and we've done the Aiken as well. And now you can see the rotational correction is solid. She basically was full weight bearing at 10 days. Here she is at six weeks. Yeah, she's got a little swelling, but that's pretty good for an operation. And she's back in regular shoes. Uh, in the old days, she would just be talking about weight bearing in the boot at this point. So um, the rotational correction, again, the lateral aspect of the metatarsal head becomes sharp uh, and not rounded when you do this. What about our results? This is the first 30 patients we did. So there's still some learning curve involved here, um, but uh, now I'm up to about 80 patients and need to go back and look them up at this point. Uh, so if we look at uh, where we were in our first 30, I was doing lateral releases more commonly, doing it less commonly now. We added distal chevron in a few because if you do a true congenital, you may, there, I do still believe that there are patients out there with high DMAAs. They do exist, but they are true congenitals. There does not as many of them as we once thought. I probably do a few more Akins now, but you can also do a chylectomy and a calcaneal bone graft in some. Uh, we began weight bearing in the post-op at the first post-op visit um, at around eight to 14 days. They all transitioned to regular shoes at six weeks. Um, I, that, that's a typo that's uh, actually about uh, 
three, mil three millimeters of shortening is what it's supposed to be. Uh, we had one non-union, uh, which required revision with a with a first TMT fusion. If you get a non-union, it is easy to revise. You leave the nail in, you can put a plate on from the medial side and simply bone graft it. So it's a small open incision to do it. We did have one recurrence requiring a distal chevron. That's a case I may show if we've got about five minutes left. Um, and then we had a fourth metatarsal stress fracture, which resolved with conservative treatment. So in general, um, there's been a trend away from proximal osteotomies. There's always going to be a role for the lapidus, regardless of whether you're like me and you're starting to do it more and more often in place of proximals, or if you simply do it for those that have traditional indications. The traditional MIS distal osteotomy has some limitations for severe bunions because it does not correct the issue at the TMT, the instability at the TMT. In fact, it accentuates the deformity when you do those large shift chevrons. And I worry, particularly in context of what we know about long-term tenure follow-up of bunions done with osteotomies, where we're headed when we simply do those and say, all right, it looks good now. What's a, what about the future? Immediate weight bearing for the uh, percutaneous lapidus and the lapidus nail is a major benefit. Now, orthogonal plating is a, is a biomechanically sound, but it is always an open technique, regardless of uh, what you may hear. Uh, it is still an open technique. Um, and the saw cuts do imply significant potential for shortening in practice, as opposed to doing it with the burr. So what matters? Reliability of correction, the ease of surgery, early weight bearing, absence of shortening, and MIS. I'm going to tell you that I think this the, the procedure ticks all those boxes with perhaps the issue of ease of surgery. I'm not going to tell you this is an easy surgery. I think this is a tricky surgery. Um, the advantage of it, though, is that anytime you're learning MIS, you can always stop if you're not how, happy with how it's going and convert to an open procedure. So it is there. Those options are there for you as you're doing the procedure. And with time, you become more skilled at the MIS and you become able to do even more complex procedures like the lapidus in that way. I'm going to show one cautionary tale and then I'll stop because I think I'm running up against my time here. So this is a congenital hallux valgus in a 22-year-old female. In fact, this was one of the complications that I was showing you in that result of the first 30. So this patient probably, in fact, has a high DMAA. I don't know. Um, she does have some instability in the transverse plane here, as you see, but she's only 22. She hasn't been wearing high-heeled shoes for very long. So we did this procedure. We were pretty happy with this. Um, in terms of clinically, it looked pretty good. Uh, remember, we're not doing any medial reefing with these cases. We certainly got her to heal here. She had a nice sharp lateral corner, but you know what? That DMAA, if you believe it, and I do believe in it for certain cases, it's still a little high. And so what happens? She ends up drifting back. Now, the other issue is she probably had a little bit of intercuneiform instability. And if I'm going to say, where is, the, where is the future going in terms of what we need to figure out? We need to figure out who needs the traditional lapidus to deal with intercuneiform instability and who can get by with the modified lapidus. And I certainly don't have that figured out. I am hopeful that some form of weight-bearing CT imaging, perhaps with, perhaps with a little bit of stress, is going to help us figure that out in the future. Those are research topics. But so, so, Greg, can I just yes. interrupt you for a minute? You know, this is really fascinating because it, it raises the question of what is the indication for a true lapidus versus a modified lapidus, regardless of fixation. Now, do you routinely do an intermetatarsal squeeze test once you've done your fixation to assess for um, instability between medial and middle cuneiform? Yes. I do. So what and, do you think? So I what have, do you think went wrong here? Well, I didn't do it on this one because it was in the early days. So <laughs> this is this is probably my fourth case. Um, but she's the she's one of the ones that taught me to look out for this problem. And I have put prophylactic screws in here between. Now the nice thing is it's easy to drop screws because this this was a four hole nail, which is also not one I use now. It's an older case, but right in here where, where you would be shooting through this screw is an easy place to shoot across the cuneiforms yeah, for or, sure. or even shoot this way. So there's lots Please. of options. There's a lot of real estate. While that nail looks pretty big, there's in fact a ton of real estate. And in fact- Can I see, can we just see that pre-op again? Uh, sure. There you go. 
Yeah. And it doesn't look like there's any cuneiform instability there. No, it, it, it's so hard to tell. That's why I, no. I really think the only way you can determine the need for it uh, is intraoperatively because it cannot be based on the preoperative obliquity or the angle and so on. This is very, very interesting. Correct. And I am hopeful that we can come up with a stress weight bearing CT that would give you some hope. But I think that's a research topic. So anyway, that's a cautionary tale. Uh, she did well because she came back to have her other side done and we converted her to traditional lapidus and just basically added that screw. Uh, and uh, I also added a closing wedge distal uh, chevron to correct. But she did fine when we were there and we were able to do that at the time we did her other side and keep her weight bearing. It's, it's uh, 10 tell. I'm gonna go ahead and stop everybody. Hopefully I haven't run past. I'll stop share and uh, move it on. Uh, Ken, I think you're next. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Guy. And before we uh, move forward, we do have one question from the chat. Um, can you discuss the importance of preserving the length of the first ray when doing a lapidus procedure? Well, well I'll discuss it. I think it's very important. Um, it's, uh, it's a concern because we do get more shortening with a lapidus um, inherently because you have an obligatory three to four millimeters of shortening as opposed to the kerf of a saw blade. Um, and we have less opportunity to orient, say, if you're doing a distal osteotomy, you can always orient that distal osteotomy a little bit obliquely to lengthen as you shift. So um, you do get some shortening. Um, I think there is importance in, in the technique of the lapidus to avoid, uh, for instance, making large saw cuts so that you get excessive shortening. Uh, but the other critical point is not to uh, dorsiflex the first ray when you uh, fix the lap. Mark, do you have anything to add to that or Ken? Or yeah, that? you know, um, there is, the, um, I don't want to say a move, but a much greater awareness of the need for a preserved wedge uh, with these procedures. When you've got, when you're starting with a slightly short metatarsal, when always when you're doing a revision, but you know, I, I don't think that using an MIS approach uh, is going to cause shortening. And it pr probably is not as relevant as when you're doing an open approach and when uh, things could go wrong because of too much bone resection. You know, it, obviously it, it brings one to the discussion of how do you do your debridement? How do you prepare the joint? Are you going to use uh, a, a an open jig for doing it. I, I don't know whether maybe Texas or Ken wants to add something to that, but you know, it, I, I will say that it was with the open techniques that more shortening were uh, was more likely. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Mark. I, I think that you're not more likely to shorten it with an MIS technique if, if done carefully. Um, but I, I agree with what Greg said. You're always going to shorten it a little bit. You, you have to because you're taking away the articular surface and potentially some bone, particularly if there's a big angle to correct. The, the key is to not dorsiflex it because if you fuse it in a dorsiflex position, you're, you're going to have a lot of the problems that you had initially, transfer metatarsalgia uh, and even potentially recurrence. So um, putting it in the right position mitigates the need to lengthen. Um, I don't know, Mark, you mentioned there's a move toward preserved wedges. I, I like it. I have a couple of cases that I'll show. Um, I think I, I like preserving length. I think it makes it more predictable, but it's not always necessary as long as you're careful with your joint prep. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I, I pay attention to the length and, the, and I really look at the joint prep and I'll try to... Um, maintain the, 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 I'll try to break the subchondro bone, but not necessarily saw it off. And I'm a, a fan of using calcaneal auto grafts. So sometimes it's almost even like wedging a little bit on the medial side, stuffing it with some calcaneal auto grafts, trying to maintain a little bit of uh, length that way. And then making sure that, like everybody has said, and, uh, prevent going into uh, dorsal. Okay, uh, I'll go ahead and get going with mine. Uh, that, can you confirm you can see this okay? <clears throat> Outstanding. So 
Th those were outstanding talks. I, I really learned a lot, uh, Greg and Mark. Thank you for that. It, it gives a nice background so that I can sort of frame how my thinking has evolved um, since I, uh, I graduated uh, my fellowship. So a, a lot of these points have been covered, but I would say the most important uh, evolution ha has been our view of the multiplanar nature of a hallux valgus deformity, particularly in rotation. Uh, we, or at least I, am much better now than I was five or six years ago on recognizing the rotational deformity and correcting it, because I think that was a, a big reason for recurrences in many cases. Um, we also know that you know the first TMT joint is inherently unstable, and, and if you do another procedure in an unstable TMT joint, it's sure to recur. I, I did far more opening wedge osteotomies as a fellow than I did lapidus procedures. And when I started in practice, I started to see things like you see in this x-ray where there's a recurrent deformity um, because that wasn't the right operation. So the, the evolution for me has been largely to recognize the, the importance of, of choosing the lapidus procedure um, because osteotomies are less predictable. So. I'm very careful to, to assess hyper, hypermobility in the first ray, not only on clinical examination, but on x-ray. Um, you know, I'll do this for the more severe deformities. I think it's more predictable than, in my hands, than the MIS techniques or, or osteotomies of the metatarsal. And then if you see coexistent signs of instability, transfer lesions, uh, dorsiflex position at the TMT joint, uh, or significant rotational deformities, it's much more predictable to, to do a lapidus procedure. Um, so our, our, our goals, uh, as we know, are to restore all deformity, all planes of deformity, and, um, and to, to make sure that that sesamoid NTP joint is reduced. And you want to restore that weight-bearing function. So it, it, you will shorten it a little bit, but you want to make sure that, that the first contact point is still the first ray, so you're not overloading the, the second and, and other lesser metatarsals. Um, joint prep is critical. This has really been covered. Uh, you, you, know, you have to get all that cartilage out and, and fenestrate the bone to make sure that there's a, a good opportunity for bleeding. I don't routinely bone graft unless there's some risk factor um, or in a revision case or, or if I'm trying to make up length as, uh, as Mark illustrated. But that's a, that's a really important part of making sure that this heals. Um, the reduction techniques I think have been really well covered by, by Mark and uh, uh, and Greg, so I won't, I won't dive deep into that. So the fixation is another point where I've evolved. Um, you know, I, I use cross screw fixation in many cases or early on. This is a very effective technique. Um, as long as you get a good joint, joint prep and get the metatarsal in the right position, this can heal. Uh, the, the disadvantage is, uh, or the advantage is that they're very inexpensive. You can do it through a smaller dissection. You don't have to open it up quite as much as when you're doing plates. Um, and, and you can save money over other techniques. Um, so this is an example of a case, decent deformity, but you're able to get a nice correction uh, and get those bones to heal. The, the downside in my view is that there's a movement toward earlier rehabilitation. And Greg mentioned that you know with the nail, it's a stable enough implant that you can let them weight bear right away. I never really felt comfortable with that with cross screws because unless the bone quality is rock solid and you know you had good bone contact, there's always that worry that it's gonna gap a little bit, you know, particularly in a, in a patient that's not gonna follow the rules. So I'd, I'd keep them non-weight bearing and immobilized for longer periods of time. And there's still that risk of non-union. You know, we studied screws versus plates in MTP fusions and found that screws do really well in good bone. They, do, they don't do well at all in, in low BMD. Um, and that's a little bit hard for us to measure in, in, in current practice. Um, so, uh, the, uh, sorry, just gotta move something here. Um, so I, I moved to, uh, to a medial plate. Mark illustrated this well. The advantage of a medial plate is it's really technically easy um, and, and it provides stability in the transverse plane that I think is, is really important. You still have to do the joint prep and get the joint into the right position, correct your rotational deformity, uh, remove the medial eminence if that's symptomatic. Uh, but I find uh, a, a lag screw with a medial plate to be very predictable uh, and allow me uh, early weight bearing. So um, I did dabble a little bit in a dual plating technique um, and, and I found it, it's effective. Um, the, the company that developed this, I, I think it can be credited for really helping us understand the multiplanar deformity, particularly with rotation. 
Um, so we did learn a lot from this technique um, and it's effective. The downside is that it's a big dissection. You have to dissect dorsally, uh, medially and plantarly in order to get these screws in place. Um, I didn't like the um, the unicortical screws again in poor bone. I just didn't I didn't have as much confidence in it. Uh, the compression was inconsistent, and I, I think it at least at my hospital this was really expensive. You know there there's a buck uh, at using this device because it's three x what a standard plate and screw construct would be, um, and so I, I moved away from it and, and toward the the single um, uh, medial plate uh, technique. So this is an example: a 69 year old female has got that moderate to severe bunion with the with the crossover toes, some arthritic changes. Um, so for me, this is the uh, the classic uh, medial plate uh, lapidus uh, technique um, to restore the position of the sesamoids. Um, another case, now I, I, I prefer the medial plate. I do like the lapidus nail. Um, so it, it, in my hands, it's particularly in patients who have skin compromise, who have some soft tissue envelope compromise that uh, that make would make me a little bit unsure about uh, about doing a, a large open dissection. So I do like the lapidus nail, um, uh, you know, for those cases um, and the MIS approach. But I would say I do more more open approaches than uh, than anything else. Um, Postoperatively, you know, th this I think we, we've gone through reasonably well. I'm very aggressive with range of motion. I think it's important to not let that big toe get stiff. Um, but I keep a bunion dressing on for a couple of weeks and keep the patient's uh, heel weight bearing. Um, and so I'm confident in, in the bone healing to let them uh, weight bear usually hey, in about Ken, a few weeks. Uh, Ken, yes, I'm curious, has, has your, uh, it, currently is your post-operative protocol the same for all bunions, including the lapidus? Uh, it, it, is, it is not. I'm, I'm, I will let a lapidus weight bear earlier than I will um, an osteotomy. I have, I have more okay. confidence in that medial plate than I would a, a couple of screws. So, um, so yeah, I, I think I'm probably a little more aggressive with weight bearing with a plated uh, lapidus um, than I am with, uh, you know, with like a, 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 an osteotomy type of procedure, distal chevron. You know, you know, that is so important because it, we've come full circle, you know, yeah. in the, in the eighties and nineties, we kept these patients non-weight bearing for six weeks, and we all thought that your recovery from the lapidus took so much longer, but indeed it, it does not. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And that, and th that is an evolution. This used to be a six week non-weight bearing situation. And then we got confidence to let them walk at two weeks. And then, you know, Greg Burlett published and others published on immediate weight bearing. And we have a lot more confidence. And I think that the implants have, have played a big role in that. So uh, to sum it up, the keys to a good outcome is thorough joint preparation. You, you have to do an adequate release of soft tissues. If, if you don't get the toe aligned well and articulating well, it's likely going to recur or fall into varus if, if it's the other way. Um, you need to correct all planes of deformity. You need to be cognizant of, of all of the fixation options that you have. Um, more stability should be selected if you're concerned about bone quality. Um, I, I'd rather add a screw or cross the intermetatarsal joint um, if I'm worried about, uh, about bone quality or about stability. Um, obviously, you want to recognize and correct lesser digit deformities, uh, and you want to create realistic expectations. I, I, I find that swelling is really the culprit. Uh, pain's not as big an issue, and most of these patients, when their medial column is stabilized, they're walking with much more comfort early on. They, they say at two weeks, this feels so much better but it's gonna be swollen for three to six months. And so, you know, letting patients know, you know, what, what to expect, I think is really critical to, uh, to high satisfaction and, and a good outcome. So lapidus we know is powerful, um, corrects all com components of the deformity. Um, and it's kind of the only salvage deformity when there's a failed, uh, failed proximal osteotomy. So what I'd like to do now, I, I think there was time for, uh, for some cases. Um, so, uh, do I have time to go through a few cases here? I didn't. I didn't build mine into my into my uh, into my talk. I, I put them separate because I thought I'd, I'd make this a little bit interactive. Okay. So th this is. I've got four cases here. How much? How much time do I have? Am I good? All right. I'll, I'll go through the simple one first. This is a forty-seven-year-old patient with. 
uh, with a progressive bunion deformity. Um, and this is what it looks like. Um, so Greg, maybe I'll ask you if, uh, if this can be interactive, how, how would you approach this patient? Greg's, Greg's no longer on the- Oh, uh, that's right, the he had to duck Maybe, off. maybe right. ask, go to Tejas. Uh, te Tejas, what do, you, what do you think about this? How would you approach this, this patient? You're muted if you're speaking. Sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry man. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks. Um, so a couple of things that kind of jump out, you know, the, the, the size of the bunion itself, the high IM angle. Um, looking on the lateral, we see that there's, uh, you know, the, the increase in Taylor first metatarsal angle with perhaps a midfoot collapse. Maybe it's navicular cuneiform, but certainly has uh, increase uh, into uh, 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 the collapse of the midfoot, and then the the MTP joints look uh, unstable. So I kind of I, on exam want to know what the what kind of you know if they're having metatarsalgia, if the second, third, fourth MTP joints are, are bothering them. Because um, if they are, I'll, you know, want to address that as well. Um, the you know kind of. Taking all that into consideration, I think that, you know, uh, in my hands, uh, it'd be an open lapidus procedure with the medial plate and lag screen. Really uh, try to focus on plantar flexing the, the first T and T joint, trying to help correct some of the, some of the uh, 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 collapse of the arch. Um, and then if, if the uh, MTP joints are bothersome, if they're having some metatarsalgia, I, I Probably do oh, some wild osteotomies and maybe even a flexor to extensive tendon transfer if they have instability. Yeah, so I, I think you, you nailed it. Um, you know, obviously you have to correct the deformity and, and plantar flex. In, in cases like this where there's real MTP joint deformity of the lesser toes, I'm much more likely to address that with, uh, you know, I use a Macera osteotomy, but a while is, is also excellent uh, in order to prevent that transfer metatarsalgia from persisting. Um, I also think it's really important to get a sesamoid view. This is something that I kind of picked up. It's not difficult. You can just put the foot on the, the mini C arm. Um, and if you get the right ankle and dorsiflex the toe, you can confirm that the sulcus is restored and that the sesamoids are articulating where they're supposed to. That's really, really important because if you miss that, um, it's more likely to recur. Um, and then this is my soft tissue dressing and, and this is kind of the, the final result. Um, so, Mark, I'm, I'm curious about your approach here. So th this is, you know, you alluded to this and showed a couple of metatarsus adductus cases. So this is a significant bunion, but the IM angle is not very high. So what's your approach to this patient? I think the key to this has nothing to do with the first metatarsal. The key is going to be correction of your second through the fourth. And I will tell you sometimes even the fifth because you're, you're not going to get terribly much correction of your lesser toe deformities, because th these are windswept toes, until you correct the metatarsal. So this is one where I would do a double osteotomy, and I would do this percutaneously. Uh, I would do a little closing wedge, uh, proximally, and then a di uh, not necessarily diaphyseal, but an oblique MIS osteotomy uh, distally. That's the only way you're really going to easily address the adductus and the valgus deformity. Then once, you know, once you've corrected that second metatarsal, you are unmasking uh, the true uh, IM angle. Then it becomes a matter of choice. You could probably treat this uh, with an MIS procedure. Um, I, I, I like the idea of a lapidus, but I don't think it's essential here. What would the alternative be? Like a, like a distal osteotomy? Yeah, a distal osteotomy, a distal MIS procedure. Yeah. But well, I, I mean, you, you covered that well. I don't have the confidence yet with big deformity distally. I'm still baby stepping with smaller deformities, but you're exactly right. So I, I use the MIS burr. Um, to correct this. This patient had really tight uh, tissues medially, and so I, with the amount of correction, I worried about 
about a big open dissection. So um, I, I, I first prepared the joint and then I did the osteotomies that Mark mentioned percutaneously in order to correct the lesser, uh, the lesser metatarsals into position. And then I use the, uh, the the phantom nail for fixation. It's of the really line. nice, really and, nice, really nice correction. Yeah, and that, oh. that's the power of of the percutaneous uh, technique is you can get a, a significant correction without compromising soft tissues. And so this patient with a history of wound healing issues uh, had no issues with her wound. Um, so, Ken, can I ask you a technical point here about the nail? Yes. Um, when you when you insert the nail um obviously you make an uh, you you're careful as to your entry point of the nail this here looks a little bit proximal to me too close to the tarsal metatarsal joint do you want to comment on that it, it, I, I completely agree with you and we noticed that as as we were putting it in um it because i had two points of fixation distally um i felt confident with it and the patient went on to heal fine. Um, I think that it, it, in retrospect, or if I had this again, I probably would have supplemented with a plantar percutaneous screw um, just to make sure that, that I had enough compression across the joint and enough fixation. Uh, but this patient did great. Um, but, uh, but your point's well taken. I mean, it, it, this did end up a little more proximal than, uh, uh, than I would want it to be. Yeah. It's a nice result. Thank you. Um, so this is a, a malunion that I took care of. I saw this patient uh, back recently. Um, so this this was originally, so it was not my original case. Uh, screw fixation obviously uh, didn't get a, a, a great correction of the IM angle uh, or rotation. Uh, so Tejas, um, uh, how would you approach this? Yeah, these... These can get a bit complicated because sometimes even the rotational aspect of it hasn't been corrected either. So um, a lot of times if it's already healed, I, I'll take out the hardware and I'll just take a saw and just kind of open it up. And I've started to rely a bit more on the preserved wedges in these situations um, where, you know, if I need to take a little bit more bone off the, uh, the lateral side to correct the IM angle and then I can rotate it um, and, and um, try, trial some of the wedges if I need to get the length back from, from when I take the, the bone out and kind of laterally. Yeah, so I, I think I'm, I'm having trouble stumping you guys. Um, that, so you're exactly right. So obviously it's already shorted, shortened. Um, now this patient's primary complaint is was second metatarsalgia. She was really overloading that second met. Some of it was that it's dorsiflexed and and the eye angle is still there, but but some of it is that it's short. And if you do a closing wedge osteotomy to correct it, it's going to be even shorter. So I did exactly that. I, I used the preserved wedges, found the right size, and was able to restore length um, and, and get this to heal. And the, the second metatarsal uh, pain uh, went away. So I think I've, I've used up my time here. Um, so uh, I, will, I will hand it back unless there are other questions. Hey, Tejas, you're up next. Let me, uh, let me get the screen share. Is this coming up properly um, for you guys? Yeah, it looks great. Okay. Oh, those are some... Uh, Interesting cases. Um, well done with that metatarsal sectus. Those are always hard cases. Um, I, a lot of this has been covered, so I'm going to breeze through a fair amount of the, the first part of this. Um, you know, we talked about the triplanar deformity, the adduction, elevation, pronation, um, first TNT instability. We we've, we've hit on um, one of the things in, in Dr. Kenneth Hunt mentioned this is it's not just the first ray when you're talking about bunions and, and, and correcting it. If you want to pay attention to the lesser toes, second, even sometimes the third uh, toe can, can hurt. You want to adjust that as well. Um, why the, the modified lapidus or sometimes even the original lapidus type procedure um, 
and again, a lot of this has been been addressed, but uh, it's powerful, corrects all three planes, um, hypermobility, plantar gapping, lower lower recurrence rate, particularly with the bigger bunions. Um, when to proceed with caution. Um, in juvenile bunions, obviously with the open growth plates, you want to try to avoid messing with, with, with the growth there. Um, or messing with juvenile bunions in general tends to be less than satisfying. Um, Alex Rigidus, um, you, you want to make sure they have decent MTP joints before you fuse that TMT joint. Um, if, if they are stiff in the MTP joint, I think sometimes that can put a lot of stress through that through, through your fusion um, and, and kind of make it difficult to get it plantar flexed and, and I don't know if it you know, can affect your ability to reduce the iron angle as well, at least in my experience. Um, and, and then just be careful of, of, you know, in those rare cases where there is a high a DMAA or there's some element of Hollachaga syndrome, we also address that as well. Um, the surgical concerns, um, and again, a lot of this has been touched on. Um, I've, joint prep, I think, is, is critical, making sure you get down to, to bone that can fuse, that can heal, whether you're doing a, a primary case or in a re revision in particular. I am a, I am a fan of uh, some calcaneo autographs that I use a decent amount. Um, just maybe it makes me feel better in the end of the day more than anything else. Um, and then um, pay attention to that plantar aspect of the joint to make sure you don't uh, dorsiflex it or get plantar gapping. Um, plate and screw construct, again, touched on it, but uh, you know, Earlier weight bearing is a big thing now. Um, I sort of, you know, it seemed the some of the paper papers for a in particular, and, and I sort of stumble upon it because a lot of my patients have started walking on it and they seem to be doing well with earlier weight bearing. So I just sort of let all my patients start earlier weight bearing. So. Um, the uh, plate, you know, the one of the things I do like about the uh, jig and the, um, you know, with the way it's set up, I don't always use the jig for that lag screw, but um, the way it's set up, it tends to be kind of at the midline or kind of plantar to the midline of the joint, which I feel like will help prevent some of the plantar or uh, plantar gapping. It'll, it'll allow that plantar cortex to to compress a bit more uh, because of the trajectory of the lag screw, and then on top of that, you have that that plantar flange that will also help stabilize the plantar aspect of the joint, um, um, and particularly with earlier weight bearing. Theoretically, I think it helps prevent uh, uh, some of the plantar gapping, um, or at least stabilizes the plantar aspect a bit more, Doctor. Myerson did touch upon um, uh, the, the increased strength and stability of, of medial plating as well. Um, this is this the jig. Uh, Dr. Myerson's kind of shown that. And again, I like I like like I don't always use it, but uh, it, it it is nice that you get it slightly on the plantar side of the joint to get it a little sort of with a plantar compression. Um, the curvature of the plates tends to work well. Um, if you're messing around near the anterior tibialis tendon, it's nice to, that it's lower profile, fits well. And then um, the other thing that's nice is that the screws, you'll get a one to two millimeters of, of compression of the plate up against the bone. So when you're on these subcutaneous surfaces, I think it tends to be less protuberant, uh, cause less irritation when they're in shoe wear once, once the swelling comes down. Um, and then this is just, you know, again, to stress joint preparation being very important, um, uh, not just to meeting the cartilage, but breaking up the subchondral bone, trying to expose some of that cancellous bone. Um, and I, I, I have started to use preserves, uh, 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 wedges uh, more and more um, over time, trying to maintain length. Um, I, I used to use a lot of iliac press, autograph and allograph um, for some of these cases. And it's nice to just pop the wedge in, get, dial in your correction, or uh, pop the uh, uh, 
trials in, dial in your correction, you can see what, what it's going to be like, and then just pop the web and it saves a lot of time. Um, where do I use the Lapidus blades? Um, kind of touched on it at various points through the talk, but just to summarize, um, bunions, um, large eye and angles, rotational deformity, pinch instability. I'll use it for the midfoot reconstructions where they have collapse to the arch, uh, many times in conjunction with the preserved wedges. I, I use Liz Frank, I use them on Liz Franks as well. They're, they're ideal for fusions, just the way they are for Lapidus and um, um, uh, with, the, with a lot of the Liz Franks that I fuse, I'll just use a, a Lapidus plate for those uh, in the revision cases. I have some cases that we can, I guess I'll, I can go through a few of them quickly before, uh, so there's still time for some questions, but uh, this is kind of a, you know, uh, a relatively straightforward type of bunion, um, you, you know, higher IM angle. There's, if you look at the lateral, you can see that there's some radiographic evidence of first TMT instability. I think if you look a little closely, maybe there's some T, uh, second TMTOA as well. Maybe a small spur there, probably secondary to some extra stress on the second ray due to the first TMT instability. So, um, you know, my hands is, is using the uh, um, lag screw, uh, trying to get some compression, um, joint prep, and then um, the, the medial plates. Uh, uh, Ended up slightly dorsal um, as I as I kind of flex the first ray, but um, ended up I think uh, turning out well overall, reestablishing the anatomy. Um, hopefully, it offloads the second ray as well enough that uh, the, the OA uh, doesn't progress as much. In the second scene. So um, can, I, this... can, I, can I make a quick comment? I guess. Yes. So that that's a, a really nice, you know, you, you plantar flex that really nicely because there was some plainness you could see on the previous lateral. So I like that technique of cheating a little bit dorsal to give some resistance so that when you when you wait very early, there's not a recurrence of that deformity. So it's really nice. It's a nice result. Yeah, yeah, that's it's a good. Yeah, like it gives you a little extra buttress to, to that to that. And, you, and then the other thing is I try to translate the whole thing plantar a little bit, just a touch. I don't know if you can quite tell, but you know, just because it was dorsally sublux before. Um, this is a revision. This is an opening wedge that was done elsewhere, and the patient came into me for a recurrent bunion. Um, and you know, maybe there's a little element of uh, I think there's. Well, there is an element of first TMT instability there associated with the recurrence. Um, and ended up converting to a, a TMT fusion, uh, a lapidus fusion. One thing I'd say here is I think in the end missed a little bit of intracuneiform instability. I think you can see that it kind of widened a little bit afterwards. Um, but uh, at least this this was done about six months after this X-ray and, and didn't have recurrence then, but it'd be interesting to see what what it's like now. But it ended up being recurrence with that. Uh, this was just the one with the the preserved wedge. So this is a lady with rheumatoid arthritis who just completely collapsed through the midfoot. Um, with significant TMT instability. Um, she had, she, despite the second MTG joint being unstable, she actually had no forefoot um, pain there. So I kind of left that alone and just focused on the midfoot and used a uh, preserved wedge actually um, on the first TMT. And then I took another one for the second and third and just split it in half and used the wedges across one, two, and three. Um, and, and, you know, she uh, actually went on to heal well, and, and um, we were able to get that, um, her, her um, alignment, and then uh, she, she had a fair amount of hank of valgus as well, so we just included a help slide to get that, uh, get that uh, hind foot alignment back as well. 
Um, this this is just I just want to show an example of the intercuneiform instability. So this is one that I just did I think last week. So I put in the lag in, in the way actually the way I do my lag screw is I'll put the guide wire in for a, a fully threaded cannulated screw, and then I'll just over drill with a 4.0 uh, screw or 4.0 drill uh, through the through the uh, proximal phalanx and then just put in the screw and it gets quite tremendous bite through the cuneiform and compresses the joint quite well to the point sometimes where the, the screw actually goes past the cortex um, and into the cacellus bone if the, if the bone's not well. But here I, I compress the first TMT joint and then stress the uh, intercuneiform joint intra-op and you can see how unstable it is and, and how the bunion just almost immediately wants to start to recurve, you start to stress it um, through the intercuneiform joint. So I ended up taking just the, scraping the intercuneiform joint and just throwing an additional screw across the uh, intercuneiform joint there and just, uh, to, to stabilize that um, to, to get some additional stability. And then I included one trauma just to show, uh, you know, I, I will use that um, first. I'll use a lap this plate for the trauma cases as well to try and try and uh, see how you know, it works well for, for, for that situation as well in my hands. I'll, I'll make a, a medial incision like I would for, for a regular lapidus, and then I'll um, make an incision over usually the third ray to get to the, to, to the second, third, fourth of you. I'll kind of stop there a few minutes uh, shy just to allow for some questions. Thank you very okay. much, Dr. Patel. Um, let's see, we, had, we did have a couple that came through. Nick, you might have hit on these already, but um, there was one question about um, use of the first, first basically a first MTP fusion um, and sort of where that fits in your treatment algorithm for hallux valgus. <clears throat> so I, I, I think that it's a great operation, first of all, for hallux valgus. For, for me, it's when there's arthritis at the first MTP joint and no instability at the first TMT joint. Um, and then obviously, you know, re revisions of other procedures done distally for bunions. So, but I, I think it's a great primary operation in the right patient. I would, um, go ahead. I would agree with that. Um, you know, I, I, I'll use it for revisions, particularly revisions that failed in a, in a really bad way. And um, this tends to be a bit more reliable when trying to, to reconstruct something in, in, of, of that nature. Um, and then MTP, Alex Dog is with MTP. So. Perfect. Uh, Nick, did you have any more questions that came through? No, uh, I think that's it. I think uh, we addressed all the questions that came through on my end. There, there was another question here. It just came through that was look just thinking about positioning of the of the lag screw, and I'm assuming this is with the plate, um, and just you know how far inferior in the sort of that I guess it would be that you know kind of proximal medial corner are you trying to go with that screw? Are you trying to maximize your length there into that, um, or what's what what are the thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I'll normally try to maximize the, the length. Um, you know, obviously, you don't want to violate the uh, navicular cuneiform joint. Sometimes it'll come out slightly on the plantar aspect. I've had that happen where it's the, the plantar cortex and the uh, um, medial cuneiform. Um, but I found that uh, using the overdrill technique, and then I won't drill the cuneiform at all, I'll just let the mm since it's a self-drilling, self-tapping screw, it tends to get a really good bite in the cuneiform when I do that. And I think if God, Dr. Geit was on it, I don't want me to speak for him, but having heard a bunch of these presentations, he would say the same thing about the placement of the nail and just, the, the, just how critical that is to get, um, to maximize the length of your nail. And, you know, he's put in probably over a hundred of these now. And I think on average, the nail length has been 
between about 48 and 52 millimeters there, kind of in that range with, with some outliers, of course. Um, so this is, that's, that's good. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Um, any other questions, folks? There's, oh, there's another one that came through now just that said, um, are any of you using cut guides for your joint prep or are you just prepping by hand? Uh, you go, Mark. Yeah, so, you know, I used to have an inherent bias against uh, cut guides because I felt that it removed a little bit uh, more of the joint than you needed to. Um, but I must say that slowly over time, I've, I've come to see that they have a definite advantage. Um, yeah, you may end up removing a little bit more bone uh, than if you simply scrape the joint and prep the joint aggressively. Um, but it prevents, it prevents overshortening if you use the guide. Uh, I, don't, I don't use it that frequently um, because I, I'm very comfortable with just a, a very aggressive prep of the joint and then um, you know, rotating and realigning the, the joint without the wedge resection that the cut guide provides you. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much the same. I, I do like, if there's a significant angular deformity at the, at the medial cuneiform, the cut guides make it really easy because you can dial in your resection, minimize your bone resection, and then you've got the joints prepped. But my preference is to do a, a manual <clears throat> preparation to preserve that length and then just dial it in where it needs to be. I, I tend not to use the guides much either. I, I tend to do a hand hand press and dial it in. Um, I don't see anything else here. I can maybe just share a couple things that, that might be interesting for the folks that are still on the call here. So um, we do have a um, PSI project that we've started that's focused on hallux valgus. So imagine sort of PSI cut guides like you would have for um, a total ankle. So stay tuned for that. There'll be more of these um, more of these vodcasts that we're hosting over the over the next few months here throughout the remainder of the year. And we're going to try and introduce some of the those those uh, technologies that are in development as well. Dr. Myers and I were just texting back and forth talking about just ways to it, it, continue to keep people engaged here and, and increase interaction on the call. I thought this was great this evening. I want to thank our surgeon presenters. Um, and, you know, we obviously we have we have another one of these calls next week that focuses on ankle fracture. So um, usually between two and three of these a month, same, um, you know, same time, 5 p.m. Mountain time. So presenters, uh, thank you so much for your contributions. Um, attendees will put this recording up on the app tomorrow as well as our website. And uh, have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Yep.